right, today is Wednesday, September 16th, and this is a market review for the stock market activities today. Here is the agenda of the day, and we have important discussions in the options market review where we try and find trade opportunities. We will also cover the Snowflake IPO and the Fed's decision today in the headlines part of the show. And of course, we do have charts for the SPY, the triple Qs, the dollar index and the VIX. So here we go. The Dow Industrial Average closing in the green. 36.78 points or 0.13 percent. The Nasdaq closing in the red. 100 39.86 points or a decline of one and a quarter percent. S&P 500 in the red by 15.71 points or 0.48 percent. Moving on to the sector's performance of the day. Look at this energy making a comeback finally and taking the gold medal. Silver goes to real estate been outperforming all week and the bronze goes to industrials the laggards of the day led by technology communication services and consumer cyclicals aka amazon and that is of course because the majority of the consumer cyclical sector did okay today however the weighting of amazon is very large on the sector Moving on to the futures market performance. Leading the gainers of the day, crude oil. And of course, grains, specifically soy products, and canola building on the gains it had earlier in the week. Lumbar, OJ, same story in the green today. The decliners of the day, coca. Coca had an impressive rally yesterday. Today, it's giving that up. Kofi, a small decline here, perhaps finding a bottom to resume the rally at some point. And of course, lean hogs for reasons we've explained a few days ago. The volatility in lean hogs vary on the news of Chinese demand and the virus or the disease rather in Germany, the pig's disease, not the human's disease. And what's going on in the big casino, the options market, not so hot so today. Leading the day per usual, Apple with 1.7 million options traded today, 60% of those were calls. Tesla per usual in the second place, 1 million options traded today, 67% of those were calls. So the volume of calls is a little shy today, showing that investors are a little more careful today compared to earlier in the week. In the third place, General Electric with 667,000 options traded today, 78.5% of those were calls. And checking on the change of open interest. Yesterday, when we covered this section, we found out an interesting trade, a bullish trade in Exxon Mobil. And of course, I followed the trade and you saw Exxon Mobil rallied impressively today, over 5% at one point. So let's see if we can find more trades today. And when I look at the open interest, the change in open interest, nothing stands out here beside Apple, specifically the trade of the 115 strike price expiring next month. My interpretation from the trade here is somebody selling calls, the 115 calls, I'm buying the 115 puts with that financing. Expecting of course that 115 will be the top for Apple and the stock will decline from here all the way to next month. Of course I am short Apple but I would follow this trade, I actually did that today, sold the 115 calls and bought the 115 puts expiring next month. And to validate the theory here, we move to the decrease in open interest. And you can see the bullish trades on Apple, the calls, specifically anything over 120 is being closed at least for short-term expiration, meaning that traders are realizing that Apple is not gonna rally beyond 120 bucks anytime soon. And now moving on to the headlines that shape the day. Starting with uh, some economic news, we have a report saying that 60% of small business closures are now expected to be 
permanent. Of course, you heard the propaganda from the Fed chairman today saying that we're overseeing economic recoveries in many sections and now we are in the expansion phase of the recovery, which of course this report throws cold water at. And of course that narrative is bullshit to begin with. And building on that, of course, we have another report saying that consumer spending decreased in the month of August, showing that the so-called recovery was fueled by stimulus and unemployment benefits. When you take that away from the table, all of a sudden, you don't have recovery or expansion. You will dip down back into the height of the recession. And of course, you've heard from so many economists saying and presenting the double dip theory that we will dip down again and revisit or at least come close to the horrific numbers we had in the beginning of the economic downturn from the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, more color on the economic picture. We have Raytheon here firing and laying off over 15,000 employees, adding, of course, to the thousands and thousands of jobs lost in the public corporate sector alone. And here, of course, we have some news regarding the market. JP Morgan is saying that wealth funds and pension funds are expected to dump over 200 billion bucks in securities very soon. So while the big guys are dumping, the gamblers, retail, and the Robin Hoodiets are stampeding to buy. And now let's shift to one of the two major stories of the day, the Snowflake IPO. We knew that there was a big demand on this IPO, specifically when the news came out that Berkshire Hathaway and Buffett is investing in the name. The IPO was priced yesterday at 120 bucks. However, today we saw the stampede and the mania on this IPO lifting the price all the way to over 250 bucks, more than doubling the IPO price. And of course, taking the valuation of an IPO company that is still in its growth stage to over 70 billion bucks. This is of course an indication and an illustration of the mania, the market bubble that we are living in. It is a reminiscent of the 1999 bubble where you saw speculative IPOs left and right raising insane amount of money only to be met with insiders and executives dumping stocks becoming richer and of course the dummy retail investors who bought the IPO are left holding the bag. I think we will see a similar story here with Snowflake. The stock of course closed today down about 20% from the peak. I think that we're not going to see the peak price of Snowflake for years to come, meaning that the dummies who bought at the top are going to be left holding the bag. And of course, if you ask 9 out of 10 of the retail investors who stampeded today to buy this name, in 30 seconds, tell me what Snowflake does. They wouldn't know the answer. They're buying something. They don't even know what it is. They have the sheep, the herd mentality. Their herd Buffett is buying. Buffett bought, by the way, from a private investor in the name at IPO prices. They did not buy at the prices where retail investor dummies bought at. And this begs the question, of course. We always talk about the difference in mentality between the rich and the poor. The rich gets richer, the poor gets poorer. Why is that? Because the poor are dummies. The rich dangles a little shiny object, a lottery ticket in front of us, and us dummy retail investors, our eyes light up, we see green, we're seduced by the shiny object, we hand them our money, buying the lottery ticket, investing in a dream, at the highest valuations we've ever seen. And of course, the rich takes our money, gives us the lottery ticket, they bank the money, they laugh at us, and what do you know, the lottery ticket doesn't work, the stock declines, and now we're holding the bag of losses, and the losses are becoming severe, and we panic, we sell, we swallow our pride, we realize that we're stupid, and we move on. Meanwhile, the rich now have our cash. They get to buy the asset for cheaper prices and ride the same ride higher again, getting richer in the process. This is how the rich gets richer and the poor keeps getting poorer. We have no self 
Dignity, Apple, Tesla, all these stocks priced at insane valuations. Yet we continue to buy them believing in a dream, in a pipe dream that will never happen. Imagine if somebody present you with a used car, but they're asking for 10 times the fair market value because they're saying, hey, in the next 10 to 20 years, the value of this car, it's going to become a classic and the value will increase tenfold. So I'm asking you to buy it from me at that premium. Would you buy that used car? You wouldn't because you are not stupid. So why are you being stupid when investing in the stock market? Don't you have any bargaining skills? Didn't they teach you that you buy things cheap and you sell them expensive, not the other way around? But of course, the market has been invaded by these zombie traders, brainless traders who have absolutely no clue what they're doing. They downloaded Robinhood. They figured out it's cool to press a couple of buttons and watch their account value as if they were watching the scoreboard in a video game. And of course, you get the stampede and the mania we're seeing in the market. And now moving on to the second most important subject of the day, the Fed's decision and Jerome Paul's speech. The Fed is a very confused organization. They have no clue what they're doing. Jerome Paul is choking all over the place. And of course, once the COVID crisis hit, he panicked. And he realized that he should open the floodgates of liquidity and that is supposed to solve all the problems and the president will not be mean to him again. And what happened with all the flood of the liquidity is we've wasted trillions of bucks adding trillions to the national debt and to the budget deficit. And we have yet to see any positive impact from the trillions of dollars of liquidity that the Fed drowned the market and the economy with. All we've seen so far is the creation and survival of zombie companies and very wealthy companies like Apple getting more free cash and access to free cash. They didn't solve a damn thing in the real economy. And of course, there are concerns that the Fed's policy of quantitative easing on steroids and of course, their decision today of keeping interest rates at zero pretty much all the way to 2023. The question is, that would create an asset bubble and inflation in the assets market. It would not necessarily translate to inflation good inflation that is in the micro economy and when jerome was asked this question about the bubble he sounded absolutely clueless he had no idea what he was talking about all he said is hey we've been doing quantitative easing for years and years and we didn't see in above any bubble even in the housing market even stevie wonder can't see the bubble in the housing market yet jerome the fed chairman says oh there is no bubble in the housing market and there is no bubble in the stock market and even if there is we haven't seen any negative consequences from that so we'll just keep an eye on it and we'll monitor it and that's that and of course we all know that the bubble is there and it hasn't bursted yet keyword yet when that happens you will see severe economic downturn and severe economic consequences so let's hear what this moron said about the bubble today well if i could follow up in terms of the balance sheet are you concerned that uh, your actions are more likely to produce asset price inflation than goods and services inflation in other words uh, are you risking a bubble in on wall street you know so we of course we monitor financial conditions very carefully um, these are these are not uh, new questions these were questions that were very much in the air a decade ago uh, and more when uh, when the Fed first started doing QE. And I, I would say if you look at the long experience of, uh, you know, the 10-year, eight-month expansion, the longest in our recorded history, it included an awful lot of quantitative easing and low rates for seven years. And I would say it was notable for the lack of the emergence of, uh, of some sort of a financial bubble, a housing bubble, or some kind of a bubble the popping of which could threaten the expansion. That didn't happen. And frankly, it hasn't really happened around the world since then. That doesn't mean that it won't happen. But and so, it, of course, it's something that we monitor carefully. After the financial crisis, we started a new a whole division of the Fed to focus on financial stability. We look at it in every from every perspective. Uh, the FOMC gets briefed on a quarterly basis. Uh, at the board here, we talk about it more or less on an ongoing basis. So it is something we monitor. But um, 
I don't know that the uh, that the connection between uh, asset purchases and and financial stability is a particularly tight one. So, uh, but but again, we'll be we, we, we won't be uh, we'll, we won't be uh, just assuming that. We'll be checking carefully it as we go. And by the way, the, the 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 kinds of tools that we would use to address those sorts of things are not really monetary policy. It would be more tools that strengthen the financial system. And of course, the Fed keeps talking about their concerns about wealth inequality. But Jerome today said, well, we are concerned about it. We keep monitoring the situation, but we have no tools to address income and wealth inequality. That is for the federal government. But Jerome forgot that the source and the reason for wealth inequality is the Fed inflating asset bubbles, asset prices by the tsunami of liquidity and free money to public companies and to the wealthiest people in the world ensures that the rich will continue to get richer no matter what. There is a Fed put that would prevent the assets of the wealthy from declining. And that, of course, widens the gap between those rich people in our society who own and control asset prices. And of course, between the poor and the middle class who are seeing their wages stagnant and declining, and they have very little ownership in asset prices. But of course, Jerome was all over the place. He was choking, clearing his throat. He couldn't talk. He couldn't put two sentences together. And I think, of course, the market understood that the Fed is out of touch and Jerome has absolutely no clue what he's doing. All what he's saying, oh, we're projecting. We think this happened. Well, we don't know. It's unclear. It's uncertain. Yet he's making decisions as if things were certain. And then saying, oh, but we're going to be flexible here, flexible there. We have a wide variety of tools. All the dancing back and forth. The market caught up to the bullshit from Jerome and sold off, of course. Needless to mention, of course, the absurd mentioning of the word powerful today. Jerome keeps saying that his decision today and the Fed's decision and forward guidance are powerful, very, very powerful. And today we believe that uh, particularly this very strong uh, forward guidance, very powerful forward, forward guidance that we've announced today will provide strong support for the economy. Effectively, we're saying that um, rates will remain highly accommodative until the economy is far along in its recovery. And that, that should be a very powerful statement in supporting economic activity. Now we're buying uh, 120 billion in securities per month across the across the treasury curve that's also adding to uh, accommodation we do have the flexibility to adjust that tool and and the rate tool and and other tools as well but as for right now we think uh, we think that our policy setting is appropriate to support uh, the expansion we did we said from the beginning that we would first uh, try to provide um, some uh, uh, support and stability and relief in the first phase of the crisis, the acute phase, and then we would support the expansion when it came. Well, it's here and uh, it's well along. And so uh, that's why we changed our guidance today and we do have the flexibility to do, to do more when we think it's appropriate. And of course, this is the mind games and the trickery and the stupidity of the Fed thinking that we are a bunch of children who are not gonna catch up to what the Fed is doing. The Fed wants to keep interest rates as low as possible for as long as possible. And they know, of course, even with that, inflation never picked up. And they need inflation to motivate companies and employers to start spending and hiring employees, thus recovering the economy. Understand that this is what the Fed is doing. They're saying our forward guidance is so powerful, meaning that they're playing psychology games, telling me and you and corporations out there and employers out there that inflation will increase. We will let inflation increase all the way over 2%. So you guys better start employing now. You better start spending now. And you consumers out there, you better go out and start consuming before prices get higher. Of course, we know that this is bullshit because it hasn't happened the last 10 years, even with quantitative easing and the lowest interest rates ever. So the question is, what if the psychology game doesn't work out and employers don't spend and they don't hire because they don't need to expand right now? And of course, consumers 
don't go out and spend, even with the threat of inflation from the Fed, because we don't have purchasing power. We lost our jobs. We lost our savings. We're not getting unemployment benefits. We are not getting stimulus right now. So how the hell is inflation going to increase? And how the hell is the threat of increasing inflation will somehow magically work its way in the economy and will recover. But this is the Fed, of course, waving the white flag, saying that we done everything we could and we're out of ammo beside playing psychology. And maybe, maybe we can go to the nuclear option of negative interest rates and controlling the yield curve and straight out buying stocks. But even that will not help the economy overall. And of course, they're relying and they're trying to betray that it is now on the lap of the federal government to conduct fiscal policy, aka spending and more stimulus. And the Fed is saying, hey, government, we'll buy treasuries like there is no tomorrow. You need a trillion. 2 trillion, 3 trillion, 5 trillion, 10 trillion, doesn't matter to us. We'll print. You just have to pass the damn bill. As far as who's going to pay the bill later on the road, who cares? Who cares? In a few years, we're not going to even have a country anymore. And now moving on to the heat map analysis. As you can see, tech lagged the market today, specifically the big boxes of Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, and that of course waited on the Nasdaq and on the market overall. But the breadth itself was actually very good. You saw financials catching a bit today, materials, industrials, consumer defensives, real estate, even healthcare. Yet the weighting of technology, specifically the big five, is what added the pressure on the Dow, the S&P, and specifically the Nasdaq. Yet as you can see, even when you look in the technology sector, you can come to the conclusion that this is a revaluation correction, meaning it will hit the most overvalued names hardest. Case in point, Intel catching a bit today, closing in the green, Nvidia, AMD, Taiwan closing in the red. And of course, if you are paying attention and tracking the rotation trade, as I do every day, you can see that the rotation been going on for a while. Case in point, on the far right corner of the screen, there is Cisco with an S, the company that I've invested in last month. I started a position in Cisco right after their earnings, their quarterly earnings, and I kept adding to the position along the way. And you see Cisco up significantly today. And when you track it, since I bought it, it is up over 10 bucks. So the rotation is there. You just got to pay attention. And of course, if the Fed is going to keep interest rates as low as they can be for the next three years, who will benefit from that policy the most? Is it going to be the big tech names? Perhaps, but they do have cash and they're already growth names. They have access and capacity to secure very cheap loans. They've been doing that for years. It is not a problem for them. It is, however, a problem for weaker names and value names that have been struggling since the COVID crisis. The low interest rates favor these names specifically because cheap loans and cheap cash will help them get back on their feet and recover. Therefore, the investment opportunity for us retail traders isn't in the high value and high growth names. It is actually in the boring value names. And if we do have inflation and the dollar continues to decline and yields for bonds rise and we end up into a 70s like situation with a stagflation the names that will benefit the most are old school industrials and exporters so right now you need to shift your investment mentality given the situation and of course rotating to the rotation trade let's check on the scoreboard today as you can see the momentum names on your left hand side the beneficiaries of the covid crisis are taking it on the chain today closing in the red across the board while the names the comeback stocks on your right hand side are catching a bit not all of them but most of them closing in the green and of course we heard news yesterday that trump of course promising that the vaccine will be out there within four weeks he is not going to stop he will do everything in his power to release the vaccine before the elections the question is are you paying attention are you ready for that move when the vaccine announcement happened or are you going to be 
too late to the party. And now moving on to the charts analysis starting with the SPY, the S&P 500, a daily chart. As you can see, we have been rejected from the resistance of 342.50 around that number we've reversed and now we have and looking for the support at 333 around that area but keep in mind that we're also formulating the bear flag formation which is bearish and will result in a second leg lower and when we switch of course to the 15 minutes chart we can see the rejection right there after the rejection from the 342 level resistance we've started melting down all the way to the end of the day and when we shift to the chart of the nasdaq the triple q's we can see a similar situation here the former support now became resistance we got rejected and of course we're shaping the bear flag formation again and we have broken the trend we have fallen off the trend Again, when we look under the hood from a 15 minutes perspective, you can see we caught support in the beginning of the day from the trend that worked out for a little bit before we broke from the trend. And there was an attempt to climb back to the trend that was rejected, of course. And after the rejection, it was a meltdown all the way to the end of the day. What's going on in the dollar index? You can see from a daily chart that we caught support again from the downward channels upper line and it looks that the dollar will be bullish in the short term looking under the hood 15 minutes chart you can see overnight revisiting the upper line of the channel again catching support and rallying and you can see my projection short-term projection of the direction of the dollar index catching the support and testing it repeatedly and bouncing from it is a very very bullish charts behavior and the last chart of the day we have the vix you can see the vix also catching support again revisiting support in the blue line and bouncing from it that is positive for the vix and of course we're waiting and anticipating the next leg higher in the vix it is only a matter of time now and lastly let's conclude this video of course we have the big anticipated event of apple out of the way that was a total disappointment. And we do have the Snowflake IPO. That was another catalyst for the market. It is out of the picture. We saw the mania. Snowflake will probably trade in the red tomorrow. And we will revisit Snowflake and ask the question, was this a mania that we overpriced the IPO? And of course, the answer will be, of course. And the third event that we got out of the way, of course, a catalyst, a positive one for the market is the Fed. The Fed disappointed, it was expected. Keeping interest rates low was in the books already. We were waiting for another positive surprise. That did not happen from the Fed, so that goes in the back burner. And now we only have one positive catalyst left, specifically for Tesla, that is battery day. After that, there is no support for this market whatsoever, and we could actually give up as soon as tomorrow. Because on Friday, of course, we have the quadruple witching event. For the newbies out there, what is quadruple witching? It is, of course, the Friday trading day. I think it happens four times a year in September, December, August, and March. Not sure, but I'm positive that it happens in September. And of course, it is the day where all asset classes, the options for asset classes come to expiration. Quadruple witching is assumed to have increased volatility as we head closer to the day. Sometimes that works sometimes it doesn't however in our case of course all the action that you've seen in august specifically the last part of august the mania and the option gambling that pushed stock prices higher and created gamma squeezes all over the place the majority or a good chunk of these options are expiring this week meaning that options riders have accumulated a massive stock positions in the popular names like Facebook and Apple and Tesla are now sitting on these positions. And of course, they want as many calls as they can expire worthless. And I say calls, not puts, because the majority of the options traded this month and last month were for calls. So my expectation is that we will see option riders dumping significantly starting tomorrow and on Friday to make sure that they make as many positions as they can expire worthless. So expect an increase in volatility tomorrow and Friday due to quadruple witching. This is of course my take.
If you found the information presented in this video helpful, please subscribe, press the like button, the notification button, and follow me on social media.